All right, good morning. How we doing? Everybody still awake? All right, we are going to take all the great stories that you've heard about so far this morning, and I want to talk to you about how do we actually bring these to life in your organization. Because ultimately, coming to a session like this, it's about are the actions when you leave here different than what they were before you came? So I hope I can give you some ideas on that. I saw a story just uh, recently. This guy's walking through a city much like D.C., and he, he, walks, he, he just lost his job, so he's looking for a job. And he walks by a zoo, and he sees a Help Wanted ad right at the zoo. So he's like, okay, I'll go, I'll go look at it. He walks inside, meets with the zookeeper. He's like, we got lots of jobs. We, we need help with everything. We need cleaning cages. We need people to welcome the guests. And he's like, we also need a gorilla. And the guy's like, Really? He's like, yeah, well, see the gorilla suit over there in the corner. He's like, our gorilla passed away. We need somebody to be the gorilla. And he's like, okay, well, I'll give that a try. That's something new. So this guy is having the time of his life as the gorilla. He's out there in the cage. He's eating bananas. He's waving to the kids. Like, he's just having the time of his life. And he starts to get a little too confident, and he starts climbing up on different things. He's swinging on this branch. And at one point, he swings on the branch. He flies over into the lion's den. So he's sitting there, and he's starting to freak out a little bit. The lion immediately sees him, starts walking right over to him, gets right up in his face. And the guy finally just panics. He starts yelling, help, help, help. The lion gets right up in his ear, and he says, hey, buddy, if you don't stop yelling, we're both going to lose our job. (laughs) I feel like that's almost a metaphor for for some of what I see in the world of AI, where it's gotten this aura of mysticism. AI is not magic. We have to remember that. It is about computer science and how do you apply computer science to do whatever you're trying to get done in a better way. And there's a lot of imposters, there's a lot of mysticism out there. That's not what AI is about, and I hope I can bring you to life, bring that to life with you. But first, we have to be clear on definitions. I think always getting common nomenclature before I start the presentation is important. So there is a difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence. So take notes on this. I'm going to tell you how to determine the difference. So if it's written in Python, it's probably machine learning. I think you guys know that. You, you know when you see Python, that's machine learning. If it's written in PowerPoint... It's probably AI. (laughs) Again, it's like we, this is what happens to technology is we get so enamored by concepts that it's hard to distinguish what is real and what is not. But I'm going to take you through the steps of what is real today and what you can do in your organization. I think the first place every organization has to start is understand where you are today. It's hard to know where you're going to go if you don't know where you are. And AI is only as good as the data that you have to support what you're trying to do with AI. Think about this as a maturity curve for data in your organization. Left side is about cost reduction. I'm using data, I'm using technology to reduce my cost of operations. You get a little more mature to the right and start to look at things like business intelligence, data warehousing, Most of you are doing that in some capacity. Then you kind of move to self-service analytics. Can I actually get every stakeholder, employee, citizen, business partner, supplier, can I get them the data that they need for whatever they're trying to accomplish? That's self-service analytics. Ultimately, you get to, can I deliver new business models, new ways of working, new ways of organizing with AI? Think about where your organization is today. I think many are in the middle of this curve. Some, it kind of depends on the division or the part of the organization that you're in. But you have to have an intentional thought on where do I want to go? But most importantly, where am I right now? Because that understanding will ground how you move from this point. There was an MIT study about 18 months ago. It talked about how 80% of AI projects fail because of the lack of data. 
Either the data can't be found, the data is inaccessible, the data is not clean enough to work with or interact with. We like to say there's no AI without IA, meaning information architecture. There is no amount of AI sophistication that you can develop in your organization that will overcome the lack of data. AI needs IA, and that gets to where do we think you can start your journey? That is what we call the AI ladder. The AI ladder is all of the layers of sophistication that you need to think about in your organization to understand your data and get to this AI future. Think about the different rungs of the ladder. First, how do you collect data? Do you have a systematic process approach for how you're integrating data from a variety of sources? Are you integrating your traditional data warehouses and databases with open source technologies like Hadoop, like MongoDB? Data collection is the foundational component of your AI journey. Once you've collected the data, then it's about how do I organize data? And the analogy I would use is what a library does for books, we've all been to a library, what a library does for books, that's what we do for data. So think about when you're, when you're looking for a book in a library. First thing you do, you go to the card catalog. It's got a list of all the books in the library and exactly where you can find those books. If you have 10 copies of the same book, it can delineate which ones have been checked out versus which ones are in stock. Maybe some have been archived into microfilm. When I talk about data organization, it's really just the card catalog for all your data, whether it's on-premise, in a private cloud, in a variety of different public clouds. You have to have this understanding of how your data is organized once you've collected it. From there, we go to analyze. So how do I start to visualize, analyze, do predictive analytics? Now that I understand my data, I can start to put it into action through data analysis. And then the top of the ladder is how do you begin to infuse this into your business processes, into the ways that you work today? AI is not something that happens on the side. It is something that is foundational to how you run your business. So it becomes about how do I infuse AI into my business processes, into the ways that I'm working today. And the direction that we see the industry going is how do you build all of these components of the AI ladder, but do it in a cloud-native way, which means microservices on containers. Because what that gives you is portability. So you can take your on-premise workloads, deploy them in a cloud-native architecture. That means they can run wherever you want them to run at any time. So what are we doing at IBM around data and AI? I talked about foundational data pieces, working from the bottom up here. We have delivered a cloud-native architecture that is IBM Cloud Private for Data. That is the data microservices that run on any cloud that you want. I talked about the foundational components of the ladder. Now let's kind of break down AI and what that is. I think AI is actually very simple when you break it down to its elements. First, we provide tools if you want to build your own AI. So think about it as a, a toolkit if your organization has decided we want to build our own AI that's specific to our organization. It's how you build AI models, how you run AI models, how you manage the life cycle of your AI models, how you explain the answers that you're getting, how you understand if there's bias in your models. It's very simple. It's build, run, manage. Those are the tools that you need to build your own AI. We have Watson Studio. We have Watson Machine Learning, Watson OpenScale, the key capabilities for the toolkit to build your own AI. Now, we've worked with thousands of organizations around the world. Sri shared many of those as he was going through his presentation. We started to see some common patterns, and we said, hey, we could make this really easy by building applications that would enable any organization to implement AI in a very easy manner. The first thing that we attacked, customer service. 
every entity, every organization is trying to serve people outside of their walls. So we built Watson Assistant, which is AI for customer service, automating 50% plus of the interactions and doing that in a very elegant way. Watson Discovery for data discovery. So every organization that's trying to understand their data, the first piece becomes how do I discover all of my the intelligence that exists inside the organization. We've got Watson Health, applications designed for providing better health care. But again, the idea is very simple. It's tools to build your own AI, and it's applications where we've built the AI for you that solve known business problems. It's about you figuring out where do you want to start on that journey. I think every organization is going to do both. Every organization is going to have to build some AI of their own, and they're also going to want some applications that makes it really easy to put those into work. One example from the industrial sector is Boeing. And Boeing is an organization I think that probably looks like many of you to some extent. Has a long heritage, been around for a long time. Many systems collecting a lot of different data. They have a lot of interest in starting to aggressively incorporate open source into what they're doing. They have adopted our Cloud Private for Data, our data microservice architecture, to enable their entire data and application platform on containers. And they've gone from a thing where it took, you know, six to nine months to launch a new initiative down to days and weeks, because that's the benefit of getting to a cloud native architecture. And they haven't had to give up anything that they wanted to do from an open source perspective, because we've designed our data microservices and container platform to work with the best of the open source world. Little known fact, 85% of the work that happens inside of Watson today, the tool that I described, is open source. It's Python, it's R, it's Scala, it's Java, it's TensorFlow, it's Cafe, it's Teano, it's Torch, it's all the open source languages and frameworks of the world. Watson makes those much better it makes it a lot easier to put those into production. But it's not about open source or not. Open source is the lingua franca of data and AI. And you can see that in the type of work that we've done with Boeing. Recently, we announced that we've made Watson available anywhere. And this is really a reflection of the strategy I described around building on containers to provide portability. So if you build products, on top of container architectures, suddenly they can run anywhere you want. It becomes the great common denominator. It can run on AWS. It can run on Azure. It can run on your own private cloud. It can run on-premise. So we've committed to the strategy of multi-cloud for a couple reasons. One is we think it helps drastically reduce the cycle times of innovation on your side because you're not worried about trying to force fit everything into one architecture or one company's approach to doing things. So it's about speed. Number two, it's about preventing lock-in. I think we've all been around the technology industry long enough to know that there's an inevitable moment where you wake up and say, holy cow, what have I done? I've locked myself into something, and I can't get out. That's what's happening in the public clouds of the world today, proprietary APIs, proprietary applications. It's a walled garden that you can never get out of. Our approach is to eliminate the walled garden, which is if you run on a container platform, we'll run that on any cloud you want. And the minute you want to take those applications or that data and move it to another cloud or move it to your private cloud, you can do that in an instant. It's a pretty powerful strategy. I think it's really going to change how organizations are thinking about their architecture for data and AI, because I think Getting locked in to a single cloud provider is not really a strategy that anybody will intentionally implement. Let's get to a couple of examples. I want to use a banking example because I think they are solving a problem that every government organization has. Royal Bank of Scotland, global multinational bank, they deal with thousands, hundreds of thousands of consumers. 
the challenge they were focused on was, can we automate 40 to 50 percent of our customer interactions using AI? And because of that, can we free up the capacity of our customer service agents to go work on the really hard problems such that our customer sat goes through the roof? In an incredibly short period of time, less than a year, we accomplished both of those goals with Royal Bank of Scotland. They implemented Watson Assistant, the AI application for customer service that I talked about before. Now they're at the point where they're automating 40% of what comes in, and clients love it because they just get an answer. Nobody calls a bank or a government organization because they want to spend time on the phone, or at least very few people do. They, they want to solve a problem. And so if you can solve it incredibly quickly and reliably, they love that. And then secondly, for the really hard problems that can't be automated, probably won't ever be automated, the fact that you can then dedicate your customer service investment to those problems, your net promoter score or your client satisfaction goes through the roof. We've done both of those things with Royal Bank of Scotland. And the reason I wanted you guys to hear that example is that if I can think of one opportunity, one opportunity for government organizations to really change with AI, it's customer service. And Congressman talked about it a little bit, where he talked about, you know, better service, better engagement, data that I didn't have that the government's providing me. It's an incredible opportunity for all of you to think about for your organizations. We've worked with the TSA. And this has all been about threat detection. So go back to the AI ladder. TSA collects a lot of data. The problem is, if you just have a lot of data, it's really hard to find that needle in the haystack. So we had to organize the data, then had to help them analyze the data. And then, once you've done that, you can build a machine learning model where you start to classify and understand risks. And you can start to predict and detect risks before they even happen. Now, the struggle that most organizations deal with when you go down this path is you end up with massive amounts of false positives. That's almost just as bad as not knowing, because then you, you're constantly chasing false positives. But the way that we can implement machine learning models with consistent training, they get really bad, much better over time. So in a short period of time, you get to a model that's providing great capabilities for detection, but without all the false, pos false positives. Now, Franz talked about the Marine Corps before. Just to put a little bit of a technical lens on what we did here, the Marine Corps had a unique challenge where most of their insight was actually in a mix of unstructured data and structured data. And if you think about most organizations, there's typically a, you know, a metaphorical wall between the team that has the unstructured data, the team that has the structured data, the analytics or the data science is done separately for both those organizations. What we were able to do with the Marine Corps was to bring that together as a single data fabric. It's back to this idea of data collection at the foundation of the ladder. By doing that and having that as a single data fabric, that enabled them to maintain readiness, to better serve the constituents in the Marine Corps, and ultimately to get people back home safely, which was the goal. So again, if you think about all of these examples, it all comes back to this AI ladder concept. It's about how you collect, how you organize, how you analyze data, and how you infuse data with intelligence. We've built strong partnerships. You cannot be a multi-cloud platform without having great partnerships. Two of them that I think are especially relevant to the government is Cloudera, Cloudera Hortonworks, the combined entity, where at that data collection layer, a lot of work we do is data warehouses married with Hadoop operating as a single system. We extended or built off of that partnership to go with to another place that people are managing data, which is MongoDB for web applications, anything highly interactive, object type environments with MongoDB. The whole point is we are building an ecosystem of partnerships around this cloud native architecture. And as we go to multi-cloud and continue to do that, those partnerships come with us. So it really frees you up 
to use the technology that you want on any cloud, public or private. We've invested a lot of time in building great products with great design. We've been honored to receive some design awards. And as you look at how analysts are starting to recognize IBM, you can see it in a few areas. Watson Studio, leader for predictive analytics for clients that are building their own AI. The Watson Knowledge Catalog, that's the organized piece. That is the, you know, the card catalog, if you will, a leader. Our cloud-native microservice architecture on containers, Cloud Private for Data, the leader for Forrester. Watson Assistant, the number one chatbot and virtual agent for AI is Watson Assistant. And then Watson Discovery, leader for data discovery. We've invested a lot over the last decade in artificial intelligence and data, and you can see that starting to come to life with how analysts are recognizing what IBM is doing. I want to leave you with a couple thoughts. First of all, there's a, there's a view in the world that AI is going to take away a bunch of jobs. I think we should deal with that head on. But I have a little bit of a different view. AI is not going to replace managers, but managers that use AI will replace the managers that do not. I think you all need to think about that. If you're not doing something with AI today, there's somebody, somebody else, somewhere else that is. It's not about automating the job or destroying the job. It's about how do you give yourself superpowers? And the right AI applied with the right data gives you superpowers as a leader in your organization. And that's how you see some companies where growth just skyrockets ahead of who they're competing with. It's because they found a way to give their people or to give themselves those superpowers. There's a story about J.P. Morgan late in his career. Famous banker. I think he was the richest man in the world at the time. He's walking down the street in New York, and a guy walks up to him with an envelope. And he says, in this envelope, I hold the secret to business success, and I'll sell it to you for $25,000. J.P. Morgan's like, well, not sure I really need that, but he's like, I'm not going to do that, but he's like, how about this? If you let me read what's in the envelope, and I agree that it is the secret to business success, then I'll give you $25,000. Guy thinks about it for a second, hands him the envelope. J.P. Morgan opens the envelope, reads it, writes the guy a check for $25,000 on the spot. I don't know what was in the envelope, but I just thought I'd share that story. <laughs> um, no, I actually do know what was in the envelope. So, in the envelope, it said, two things you have to do every day when you wake up. Number one, make a list of the things that have to get done. Number two, do them. Pretty simple, but also pretty elegant and precise. If you think about the world that we live in, there's lots of distractions every day. There's thousands of things any of us could be doing. But think about for this world of data and AI, when you get up tomorrow, what is the list of things that you can make that have to get done for you to get started on your data and AI journey? And then number two, let's go do them. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Today, there are more sensors on our planet than people. We're putting AI into everything and everything into the cloud. It's all so smart, but how do you work with it? Ask this farmer. He's using satellite data to help increase crop yields. That's smart for the food we eat. At this port, supply chains are becoming more transparent with blockchain. That's smart for millions of shipments. In this lab, researchers are working with Watson to help them find new treatments. That's smart for medicine. At this bank, the world's most encrypted mainframe is helping prevent cybercrime. That's smart for everyone. And in Africa, IoT sensors and the IBM cloud are protecting endangered animals. That's smart for rhinos. Yeah, rhinos. Because smart only really matters when we put it to work. Not just for a few of us, but for all of us. 
Let's put smart to work. 